Hey guys, welcome back to the shop. So this week I'm working on a batch of hatchets and axes. This is uh, something I've been needing to do for a month or two now. Finally getting to it and it is July in South Plains of Texas. So we're looking at some some nice triple digit temperatures. Well, it's been 95 degrees at least for I don't know, it feels like a couple months now, and we're up into the hundreds. And then in the shop here, it's, uh, you know, 103, 105, whatever, depending on where you're standing, I guess. So that's kind of what uh, kind of what I'm working with here. And uh, I've got to get this batch of axes and hatchets done here. I'm doing uh, 12, 12 hatchets of different designs and then four smaller axes here this week. And uh, this is uh, coming up on close to two years of being down here in Texas. And, you know, it's, it's just something you get acclimated to, but it's still hot. You know, there's the locals, <laughs> the locals think it's hot still. So um, using, the, uh, using the bandana to, to keep my head cooled down, that helps a little bit. I bought a 30-inch... Uh, fan this year not really helps so staying hydrated that's the absolute biggest thing right there you gotta get a good sweat going and keep that breeze going and you can you can uh, do all right so just working with a one inch by three inch steel stock here and that requires that I forge it down to a, a suitable uh, proportions before I try to punch the eye and on my little trail hatchets I can cut it to where it's uh, it's good to go I don't have to forge it down but everything else anything bigger I have to uh, forge it down to more of a one two three uh, proportion so approximately one inch thick by Two inches wide by three inches long and that's that's approximate but it doesn't work too good to try to punch a real wide billet or tall billet I guess would be more more accurate way of saying it so yeah just working the bats through here um, keeping that punch in the press cooled down every single pass uh, that just saves a lot of going back to the grinder to dress the punch up so I noticed that the filter on my press here is seeping some uh, some hydraulic fluid. That's not a good sign. So I went ahead and ran to the auto parts store and got a new new one, got a replacement, and uh, put that on because I've had I've had filters blow up on me before. Um, had had a failure before, <laughs> and so didn't want that to happen and uh, notice that the new one was seeping a little bit after a while as well I think it has something to do with the high temperatures in the expansion of the hydraulic oil in the system something like that just probably doesn't like it too well so that uh, that last build you saw there was the uh, the pack axe billet and that's going to be about a two and a half pound head so that's the biggest uh, stock that we're working with here today. And uh, I was I was forging down some of those other billets on the Little Giant, on the 50 pound there. But once we get up into those bigger billets, it's just not it's not um, even really worth the time. It's it's really not big enough to do that anyway. But you're able to do it and get it done on the smaller billets. The only saving grace is that you can keep the heat in the billet longer on the on the hammer than you can the press so getting a, getting a punch I'm starting my and starting my first uh, series of drifts here the first one you saw there no that wasn't the first one that was no I guess that was the first one this would be the second and this is my uh, working drift here to start drawing out the lugs the cheeks and the lugs on this uh, hatchet here Now the steel that I'm using, as usual, is the is this 1060 steel, 
I'm actually able to purchase it locally from a regional supplier, I guess it would be, through a regional supplier. But it's actually manufactured down in Saugeen, Texas uh, at a mill down there, so that's kind of neat. So there's all our billets. They're looking really good at this point. And the next thing we need to do is start drawing out the bits on these. And these are, um, there's, you know, like I say, four different styles here and sizes uh, of axe and or hatchet here. But it generally starts the same way, just drawing out some length on that uh, steel there. And then this particular one right here is, uh, I believe it's a, it's a newer um, pattern that I'm kind of experimenting with. And then using the uh, power hammer to, to dress that uh, bit up after using the press to aggressively spread that out. This right here is one of the uh, trail hatchets and this will be I guess the third drift working drift here as we continue up in size and get the eye up to where it needs to be. So I'll just point out here real quick that in this video I'm focusing on the forging processes of these axes and hatchets. But as you noticed in those billets they were sitting all, all nicely on that grate. That's because I already ground off the top lugs that invariably happen when you draw the cheeks out and draw the lugs out. And the same with the bits on these, uh, on these trail hatchets. So I didn't show that this time but just a side note that is how I clean those up. And there's other ways to do that, but that's how I'm doing it currently. Just using that, using that power hammer. Like I say, it uh, it's a little bit. Well, now that we're uh, only forging about an inch thickness here, that part's all right. It is a little bit slow on the forging, but it can do it. And again, the saving grace is that you you can keep the heat in your steel a lot longer on the power hammer than you can on the press. So this is our first uh, set here, four of the trail hatchets going into the kiln and I also added uh, three of the uh, pack axes. So we're just running normalizing cycles here. And I'll tell you what, this new kiln definitely, this is what I bought it for, and it definitely, uh, definitely worth the, worth the money. Uh, it's a 240 volt, so it uh, it's able to heat up, you know, thicker cross sections of steel much faster than the the little 120 volt kiln that I've I've had for a long time could do. So just showing uh, some of the final stages of forging on these hatchets here, getting this straightening process here. It's important that the bit of the axe or the hatchet is in line with the eye and this is something that you're paying attention to through the entire forging process and then just at the end here refining that uh, if it's not straight and in line with the eye then it's going to affect the functionality of the tool and that's obviously not good so we've got a pack axe here doing the final drift size on this is kind of my workout program right here um, yeah, it's, it's, it probably rivals a few different workout programs. If this is something that I did every single day, which of course I don't do this every single day. Um, I did it for several days straight this week, but, um, yeah, you can, uh, you can burn some, burn some calories doing this. Now the better I get at forging axes and refining my processes and tooling, that's really one of the biggest things with forging axes is your tooling. And learning how to build that and, and do it in such a way that it makes processes that you're doing um, efficient and as, you know, labor friendly as possible. I mean, you know, even in the old days, the blacksmiths out there they weren't swinging one hand hammer building axes and stuff like that they had an apprentice or several apprentices 
who were swinging, you know, sledgehammers like I was doing there, but two-handed, putting some serious, um, you know, force behind them, and you could actually, you know, you can get a lot of work done that way. But, you know, nobody was out there with one hand hammer by themselves, turning out axes and stuff like that. So, you know, using the power hammer, the press, figuring out how to do things by yourself, that's just part of the game here. So we're working on profiles. You saw the uh, some of the carving hatchets there. This is uh, cleaning up some of the trail hatchets. Getting that nice uh, flat top line there. And I believe this right here is my last batch of normalizing. And I normalize them and then I also run two grain refinement cycles as well. And so then after that we can go ahead and heat it up a final time and quench it. And all of these are up to specific temperatures that are important for doing, making the steel do what you want it to do. So this is Parks 50 quench oil. And that scale coming off most of the, uh, most of the axe head there, that's a good sign. You'll notice the thicker areas where it doesn't cool quite as quickly is where the scale tends to hang on. So as hot as it is outside, it's already 100 degrees plus, uh, that does affect how much heat your oil can take. Like if you're quenching, you know, in 60 degree weather, you can quench more pieces before you have to worry about how hot your oil's getting than if you start with 100 degree weather. So cooling that oil off in a tub of water, sort of a double, double heat sink idea there. So I've got everything, everything except for the pack axes. Those are in the tempering cycle right there, but I can go ahead and start wire brushing all these up here. Actually pretty happy I did not have to scrap anything this batch, and I'm really happy with the way the eyes turned out on, on these. Um, just, it, it's just, it's encouraging to see improvement. You know, you, no, nobody, none of us is doing things perfectly well, in any area of life, but, but uh, you know, as a craftsman, I think that's just, that's one of the qualities or the outlooks I think you have to have is that, you know what, I, this isn't going to be as good as I would like it to be. It's still a good piece, it's still a good tool, you know, very useful, very functional. And every craftsman out there who really loves what he, what he does, I believe, um, is always looking to improve. You know, where can I make this better, etc. And so that's just that's just what that's just how I think, and uh, that's part of what I enjoy about this job is seeking to improve and learn. You know, just get better at what you do. I mean, there's always something new to learn, no matter what it is that you're working on. So getting the handle shaped up, as you can see, I build them from scratch out of uh, hickory planks. And those all have to be cut out individually and uh, shaped. So start by fitting each handle to each axe head. And uh, basically it's just a matter of removing material where it shouldn't be so that the axe head fits down on there. You want it to be snug but not super tight you can crack the handle getting it into the axe head if you're not careful and then as you can see here I'm checking to make sure that the bit that we were so uh, judicious about earlier is uh, indexed properly on on the handle because even if your your eye and your bit are aligned properly on the axe head if they're not fit to the axe handle the way they should be that's you know sort of negated so again we have to pay attention to that and make adjustments where necessary so now I can go ahead and actually grind the edge on the bit and I'm doing this on the handle here you don't have to but I know I've done it both ways the only thing I don't like about doing it this way is that you have to be careful not to get the, the wood all wet and all uh, grimy from the grinding dust which is some of that's a little bit unavoidable but it mostly sands off later 
But what I do like about this is that it gives you a really good control of the of the steel of the axe head when you're grinding it. So that's definitely an advantage because you have way more to hold on to and a lever, literally, uh, to give yourself leverage on the grinder. And I'm using my slack belt attachment, which is definitely uh, a great investment, which I purchased for building axes and hatchets. The slack belt, you know, I've used it up on top of the grinder up until fairly recently for a long time, and that works not as well. It's much more difficult to get that radius um, because this one you can adjust the tension on it so you can press that bit into there and achieve the exact radius that you're looking for. Can't really do that on the just the top of the slack belt on your grinder, plus, it's not as safe as the slack belt attachment for obvious reasons. Well, it should be obvious. So now that we've got the heads fitted to the handles on at least a few of them here, we can go ahead and shape the handles. And again, that's all uh, done by hand. And I will use the slack belt, just regular on the uh, on the grinder to sand those up some more. And then finally, we can go ahead and cut the kerf for the wedge before we do the final assembly. Just doing a quick uh, hand sand down with some emery cloth to make sure everything is smooth and fits well in the hand. And some uh, generous amounts of wood glue after we've reinstalled or rehung our axe head and we're going to go ahead and put the wedge in here start it we'll start it right there and then take it over to the anvil and uh, drive it home all the way this is where you have to be careful that you don't crack your your handle and this is where you uh, also you know you learn that you don't want your wedge has to be an appropriate thickness so that you're not trying to drive an extremely thick wedge. And actually an arbor press is probably a better option here, but I don't have one of those yet, so we'll have to make do. All right, guys, well, wrapping up this week of axe forging and building, I still have most of them to assemble and finish, not getting them finished all up this week. Got other things going on too that I that I have to take care of and work on. So this is what we have done at the end of this week. And I went ahead and finished out one of each of the three main models that I've been working on for a year or two, a while. So the first one we have here is the trail hatchet. Just a real iconic, classic look. It's about a pound and a quarter, just a perfect little camp or trail hatchet, as the name uh, would suggest. Light enough to put in your pack, small enough to put in your pack, or even on your belt if you want to get a, a belt sheath for it. And it's not going to be super heavy for you, but definitely capable of some, some decent work. You can really put yourself together a good fire and, you know, a shelter, you know, in the case of an emergency or just regular routine camp chores. It's got a nice thin bit for chopping, for cutting, like a ax or a hatchet is supposed to do. It also works really great for uh, dressing out big game like elk, moose, etc. But it also has this uh, heavy wedge up here because of this overbuilt heavy eye that it has. If you want to split wood, you're going to, you know, chop into the top top grain there, and then once it gets up to here, it'll pop that right open for you. So kind of a dual purpose design here. I didn't come up with it, but I'm definitely incorporating it. This is, you know, it's been a red, it's, it's like I say, classic. But making sure to put that into my hatchets and axes for practical use. These are made to be used. These will work for you and work well. Second one we have here is the full-size carving style axe, another cla axe 
it's been a long week. <laughs> uh, Full-size carving axe, another classic design with some Nordic influences, perhaps. And again, this is uh, this is a pound and three quarter, right around there. So enough weight to where if you're working on a on a, one of your wood billets for a bowl or whatever on your chopping block or bench, you can really get some uh, some decent um, chips off of that. You can really take some material off real efficiently, uh, including with this 16 inch handle that has on here. So a little more weight, longer handle, and then it's got the toe that comes up, so you can really get that good follow through action. And, and that sort of skiving action on a carving hatchet that you that you want to have. This is a um, this is not a right or left hand. This is a center um, orient, uh, indexed axe, so it's also very versatile for a wide range of camp chores or around the home set or what have you. And once again, it does have the heavy wedge up here towards the eye that allows you to really split some some decent chunks of wood for this size of hatchet. And last but not least, on the carbon axe here, go ahead and round that pull off so you can uh, really get up close to it. There's no sharp corners here to irritate the web of your hand, and you can get in close and do some nice work with that as well. By that same token, this handle I designed so that it does not have the exaggerated kickback here. That's, uh, you see on a lot of axes, there's a purpose for that, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But this, it kind of gets in the way if you really want to choke up on the, on the uh, that's not very comfortable. So on this carving hatchet, and to a somewhat lesser degree, but also um, also on the trail, the trail hatchet as well. But on this carving axe, you can get up close there. It's a nice comfortable grip and uh, working close as well on that. And we'll point out that all of these are ground, like I mentioned, for chopping, for cutting. So they have a nice convex grind to them. They're not too thick like you will get in the store-bought crummy axes. I'm sorry, that's just what they are. Most of them, there's a car, you get what you pay for. We already all know that, right? That's why you're watching this video. And last but not least is the camp axe, or the pack axe, which I've kind of called it that a little bit, because you can still... Get this in a pack, you're not going to take this backpacking, but if you need to go a ways and set up camp, or this needs to be in your vehicle, great size for it. So we've got about a two and a half pound head here, and a 25 inch handle, so something that you can actually, and I've done it, you can chop down a tree with this, not as quick and easy as a full size felling axe, but you can do it. Uh, nice bit for cutting and chopping, and of course your wedge for splitting. And then, this also has a decent pull, and just like all of my axes, unless otherwise specifically noted, it's completely hardened and tempered, so you can use this as a proper hammer, as the word goes, uh, if you need to. So, very versatile tool for the camp around the homestead or what have you, and it's, it's got some heft to it, and uh, you can get some work done with this, but it's in a nice compact package. So. Uh, what's this about? What's this curve here? This is to bring your hand more or less mostly where you're going to be holding it closer to the edge and balance this out so that your your balance is going to be very close to the center line instead of back here. So as you're chopping, you don't have excessive bit drop and it's a lot easier to use. So. That's the point there. That pull also assists with that as well. I can't really, but you can kind of see, it doesn't really want to dive down there. It stays pretty level, and that's what you want in a felling type axe, which this will fill in on felling jobs, as well as bucking, splitting, etc., limbing, all of that good stuff. I love making these. I love the idea of somebody taking them out in the woods, whether it be the boreal forest or, you know, the uh, scrub brush of East Texas, whatever, the hill country, and using them. That's one reason why I love making them, and I appreciate you guys sharing this with me. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and get some good linseed oil coating on these, let it soak in real good. That, uh, as, as you know, protects the wood, helps keep it a consistent moisture content so it doesn't dry out or swell. And it also protects the steel for quite a good while. Uh, let that dry on there and it's just real good for it. So 
Hey, appreciate it as always. Thanks for watching. And I almost forgot, if you're interested in getting one of these things, then uh, all you have to do is go to my website, sign up for the email list, scroll down the front page of firecreekforge.com. That's my website. You'll see the uh, email sign up bar there. Get on that list. Send out notifications when I have new batches of knives and axes and stuff like that available. So you can uh, be in the loop. Appreciate it. See you on the next video.